come. The baby, baby joy. <laughs> <to see. laughs> Hello, everybody. Oh. Yay. So it's the weekend, month long, Sunday sit. So take your time to connect with the your fellow yogis. Four pages. Hmm. Hey. This is fun. Hmm. Wow. It's great. Another baby, Mia's baby. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> wow. Good morning from Thailand. This morning I'll speak about Karuna, compassion. Remember that any one of the four Brahma Viharas, when we practice that particular Brahma Vihara, Metta, Karuna, Mudita, or Upeka, all of them are nurtured, cultivated at once. So as we've been practicing the compassion, karuna, for a few days now. The metta is close. The murita, empathetic joy, is close. And the equanimity, upeka, is always there from the beginning, helping to balance and frame that particular Brahma-vihara, sublime abiding that we call forward without any equanimity it would it would slip away in into its masquerade called the uh, near enemy or its opposite in this case it's cruelty control manipulation the opposite of compassion It's awful, also help, helpful to remember that the kind of meditation we practice with Brahma Viharas is called uh, fixed concentration. Whereas the Vipassana, when we do that, and it's often helpful when we do the fixed meditation practices and get stuck and then use the mindfulness insight practice to deconstruct whatever has solidified and whatever block might be apparent and felt in the body or in the emotions. So for example, using water as a metaphor, but the Brahma Viharas and other fixed 
concentration meditation practices, it's like the cohesive polarity of water, the water's ability to bring things together, to bind them. And when we do Vipassana, the momentary concentration, moment to moment awareness, it's more like the fluid capacity of water. We obviously use both because at times we are mindful of our process of what's happening, both in getting unstuck if we feel stuck, but also just the relief of knowing we're in the present moment. So the cohesive nature of the water element is like our, our fixed concentration practice, holding it just on the compassion quality of heart, as we did with the metta last week. And, and fluid meditation is the moment to moment awareness that's always accessible whenever we need just to take a breath and lean back in the moment and feel what's happening within us, in our surround. And then when it feels appropriate to reconnect or call up again the karuna element and abide in the felt sense of care and compassion, that emotion which we're growing from our heart. Uh, or if you're using the focus around the solar plexus, the attention there on the sensations, whatever's there, even if it's, if it's hard or stiff or leathery, still that's what's coming up when we're doing this practice. So we feel that as we call up care and compassion for that very tightness, hardness, stiffness, if that's what's there. Compassion, we can aim it anywhere. Throughout our body, mind, emotional system. That's its nature, is to care and feel compassion, empathy, with whatever our experience is in this moment. It's helpful to recognize when, when grief is arising, because often it's lifted by the compassion practice and sometimes mistaken for it. We could be doing compassion, the essence, of caring and feeling compassionate energy. And suddenly we feel grief because that's what's pulled up in that moment. And at that time, for however long it's useful or helpful, we make a shelter for that grief and feel the grief. And when we can feel compassion for the grief, care, for the grief as the emotion in the heart and our sensations in the body. And sometimes we mistake the grief for compassion and it's good to know the difference. Grief is grief, it's its own whole emotion. We all experience it. It's different than compassion. Compassion, for example, is always has a sweet and pleasant feeling tone to it, grief may not. So that's one sign of compassion being compassion and being present and caring for whatever's there, including the grief. And noticing the different flavor that compassion has compared to grief or sorrow. And gratitude is another emotion that's unique. And sometimes it accompanies compassion. It's, it's a different emotion, but it frequently accompanies compassion. So as we're developing compassion for ourselves, other beings, for our surround, sometimes we feel 
gratitude along with or accompanying that, that emotion of care. We feel gratitude also for what we care for, for what we're compassionate for or towards. So just, just recognizing that. And of course, any attempt to change or control, deny experience is a form of cruelty or the opposite of compassion, which we also have to recognize and surround that, that emotion of control or manipulation with compassion itself or the mindfulness, recognizing that mind state and being with it until it slips away. And practice is like that, it goes often between the collectedness or cohesion of concentration practice and, uh, and fluidity, or it just flows along naturally. We're not looking for one or the other. They, they both occur. Sometimes we feel like we're so connected that we, that we there's an immersion of awareness into compassion becomes a compassionate awareness. At other times it feels more like a stream. It's, it's flowing along, it's fluid. Whatever it comes across in our experience, uh, we feel the flow of karuna, compassion, moving right through. Those sensations, those emotions, those mental formations, or the surround of the six senses what we see visually, the flu, flow of seeing and hearing, bodily sensing, and so forth. So just recognizing that there's no one way that compassion, the element of compassion itself or compassion meditation, no one way for it to be. We always have the choice of, of that sense of being in the present moment. So it's just like stepping aside with mindfulness and feeling our, our present time circumstances, the sensations of the body and emotions that are arising, what's going on in, our, in the immediacy around us, open our eyes and realign, so to speak, with that mindful presence, feeling in the present moment, and then Again, taking up that element of compassion. Saira Upandita used to suggest, um, when I practice Brahma Viharas with him, the moment of waking up, whatever time it was, 3.30 or 4, 4.30, the moment of being aware when I wake up, still in bed, to pick up my meditation object. So if it was compassion I was practicing, or metta, loving kindness, empathetic joy, mudita, equanimity, that's what I would pick up. Pick up the compassion and, and begin feeling that compassionate surround, just abiding in the compassion. Or if I wasn't quite awake or it was more useful, uh, Use the phrases, I care about you. I care about my body-mind system. And to allow that compassion to suffuse my body energy and the surround around. Sometimes it would be side by side with what I saw, what I heard early morning sounds in Burma or wherever. Like this morning, waking up at 5.30 or so and um, recollecting that I would be doing this talk and hearing early morning sounds, the cicadas, uh, which you might've heard last night, they were 
extremely loud, almost overwhelming. Uh, the cicadas seem to change tune you know, every few minutes, but actually it's one species stopping their rubbing of the wings and another species coming forward so that they can both survive. It's how they call a mate by rubbing the, their wings together. Anyway, it was so loud. Um, I'd, I'd be surprised if you, you couldn't hear it. So in the same way in the early morning, there's those morning insect cries and calls. And here on this island where I am, I can hear the sound of, of, of waves breaking on the shore a minute or so away. And then after those initial sounds, remembering that this is the compassion, uh, last few days of compassion practice, I picked up that, as Upandita suggested, I picked up the compassion element, our meditation object, and just felt that for my body, mind, the surround, what I could hear, what I could see. It was dark, you know, so I turned lights on and then could see the bare glow of the rising sun behind me. And uh, look, looking ahead, it took a while, but the clouds on the horizon started to pick up the glint of pink and salmon color and a gradual growing of the morning sun from the opposite horizon. It's a nice way to wake up with any of these Brahma Viharas or all of them. Uh, now, having done the metta practice, you can add that to some moments of metta and notice the difference when you call up compassion, karuna, the different flavor, the, the even, evenness, the all-inclusivity of, of metta's goodwill and wishing for all beings to be happy and peaceful. And then the flavor of karuna, compassion, which particularly tunes in to a being's, our own or others, pain, hurt, blockages, contractions, distress, disconnection, whatever it may be, all beings every day feel degrees of, of dukkha, of suffering, just in taking care of ourselves, to wake up and wash and relieve ourselves or feed ourselves. And the daily chores of just self-care itself. It's a subtle, subtle dukkha, dukkha. We may be in a good mood, but if you look closely, still it's, it's work we have to do daily, uh, habitually in a way, just to maintain ourselves, relieve hunger and take care of things, repair things and, and then move through our day the way we might do. So all the little pleasant things and potentially unpleasant things that we meet in a day uh, and how compassion might be useful in helping lay out the world before us. Um, 20 years ago this year, um, I, I came I came to this island having been here the year before and having friends here. But this time it was really different. The, the day before was that huge uh, Asian tsunami. And here it was devastation. This building that used to be right where I'm sitting now, completely broken up and washed away. And uh, it was just really a terrible 
thing to walk into. I remember thinking, this must be what it's like in the aftermath of a battlefield. Everything I saw, all the senses, it was just so incredibly overpowering. Maybe any other time, I, I couldn't take it and I'd need to leave or seek refuge somewhere. But in this situation, because it was called for, I had friends here and friends missing and friends who were kind of devastated, not all were on the island. In fact, most were off the island at that time. But there was there were things to do. There's things that needed to be taken care of. And people we needed to look for in the, in the mangroves behind me. So I, I felt all that energy coming forward. As I mentioned once before in the last retreat, um, it was the same when I was with each of my parents when they were taking their last breaths. Uh, what sustained my being present for them in exactly the way they needed, I later realized was compassion. I didn't need to call it up. It, it was just there. It was just there and like water, it, it, it moved in either a cohesive presence or a fluidity, a fluidity that accompanied where they were at in their last breaths with their eyes open or looking at me or looking around. And in that I, I recognize later as a result of, the, of this practice we're all doing, the, the nimbleness, the fluidity and sort of binding nature of, of compassion to be present and just the way that was needed. So 20 years ago, um, you know, survivors needed a calm presence that just went about doing what needed to be done, uh, which including looking for missing friends and so forth. And, and out of those really difficult and challenging days grew a compassion community that is, is ongoing, lasting and profound. Here right now, there's, there are several uh, friends from that very time who are on island and in their, in their respective houses um, between here and the in the main building 15 minutes away. And there's that recognition. Not that we talk about it every time we meet, but there's just the recognition of that time 20 years ago. And that sense of the community, the compassion community that connects us all through that. You might have a similar experience with parents or friends um, having difficulty in pain in one way or another, and how, how, best, how best to be in the face of their suffering, pain, distress, disconnection. You know, you've, you've had that experience and then can tell or recognize, oh, right, that was compassion in its cohesive way of being completely present, abiding without thinking about it in this field or surround of care. You know that feeling, that's karuna. Or if events were kind of happening at a different pace, and the compassion had to take on a more fluid nature 
to accompany those changing conditions, changing events. That's recognizable. And I, I recall that, of course, every time I come here and talk to some of the people I knew then or knew from that time for the first time, Even in the in even in the difficulty, you know, we feel that we feel the connection, and we feel how people respond when we are just present with thoughts and emotions, anchored in compassion, caring, or with the changing events, with the more fluid care and compassion going along with that. Sometimes it's so subtle, you know, where it might be in a conversation with someone and we, we sense their distress. They may not even be aware of it, uh, but you may be. And maybe sense that they're unable at that time to, to look at it or recognize it. But because you do, you're there just a little different. Your, your thoughts are more caring and that comes out in your emotion and, and energy. Or if you speak, it comes out in your words, the this, this soft, caring tone and, and use of the words, not truly trying to change anything or fix anything. But it's a signal, an energetic signal that you're present for them. You're receiving them or you're surrounding them with care. Ancient cultures had that ability. It was one of the it was one of the energetic forces binding their survival. And ancient culture of indigenous people in the far north of Siberia. They had a language that indicated that, that subtle connection and care for each other and for nature and nature around them. So in, in the intense freeze of that, of that northern winter, that hardly has any sunlight at all. When they would walk outside in their outbreath, the moisture of the outbreath would immediately freeze. And then those frozen, the frozen drops of moisture from our outbreath would kind of collect near each other and and contact each other, making this this tingling sound that then, like a mist or cloud of frozen moisture drops, you know, fell to the ground. That sound they called the whispering of the stars. The whispering of the stars, with that language showing it's too cold to talk to each other, but showing when they were outside in, in such frozen conditions, they, they recognized so long ago their, their presence, presence of each individual and their presence as a, a, a group or community of people, that they had a language had a language for being together in silence. The whispering of the stars, it's more silent than si silence itself in a way, or it's a kind of celebration of that silence, a way of knowing in that silence that each one of them is there and is present. So having that compassionate heart, caring heart is deeply reassuring 
to ourselves, you know, when we feel alone or disconnected, lonely, and for others, it's reassuring that we're there, that we're present, that we feel them, acknowledge them. So without a word, people sense that presence and maybe it's in the eye contact or just the body language without the eye contact, which you know, isn't always what they're wanting or used to or when we are alone and we feel that loneliness. And so we feel compassion and care for ourselves. That's the most profound self-care, this feeling wrapped by that blanket or fabric of compassion. This is a quotation from John O'Donohue. Each, each one of us is alone in the world. It takes great courage to meet the full force of your aloneness. Most of the activity in society is subconsciously designed to quell the voice crying in the wilderness within you. The mystic Thomas A. Kempis said that when you go out into the world, you return having lost some of yourself. Until you learn to include your aloneness, the lonely distraction and noise of society will seduce you into false belonging with which, with which you will only become empty and weary. When you face your aloneness, something begins to happen. Gradually, the sense of bleakness changes into a sense of true belonging. This is a slow and open-ended transaction, but it is utterly vital in order to come into rhythm with your own individuality. In a sense, this is the endless task of finding your true home within your life. It is not narcissistic, for as soon as you rest in the house of your own heart, doors and windows begin to open outwards to the world. No longer on the run from your aloneness, your connections with others become real and creative. You no longer need to covertly scrape affirmation from others or from projects outside yourself. This is slow work. It takes years to bring your mind home. Thus, we're, we're practicing compassion as a lifelong way of living. All the Brahma Viharas, although already innate, hidden only by the various blockages and, and difficulties we've met along, along the way in our lives. When the conditions are right and those blockages step aside, the qualities step forward, the kindness, the compassion, the joy, the equanimity. So to think of this as a lifelong practice, not something we attain, you know, and can go back home with and just then have. It continues to be a practice. You know, every time we meet someone else or a condition that requires the caring, the effort to be, to have a compassionate presence, to listen deeply, to recognize ourselves or another in a way that is reassuring and affirming. So to have that long range view, you know, and 
this is an opportunity where we all dip in the pool of compassion for renewal, for ourselves to be affirmed and reassured that, yeah, I know what compassion feels like, and I have it. I have it for myself. More times than I may realize, I have it for others. And that exercise, it's like strength building. We exercise the compassion muscle, and then it's stronger in our system and comes up more naturally when something else that we meet habitually might cause a reactivity from this practice. There's a response instead of a reaction, a response of presence, response of care. And when we've been wounded in some way by our life, our health, our relations, circumstances in the world, you know, our own or others. Compassion is the glue, the repair to rejoin. In, in Japan, there's a kind of pottery called Kinsu Kuroi. Kinsu Kuroi is taking a broken bowl and gluing it together with a powerful lacquer that is sprinkled once the bowl is, is being glued, it's sprinkled with the dust of silver or platinum or gold. So that when it's been so glued, there's this gleam of gold or this shimmering silver color. And the bowl then is, is stronger than ever before. It will never break in those same places. Likewise, the, the repair or the rejoinery of, of being broken ourselves um, from personal experience or experience of those around us or those far away toward whom we, we feel care. The compassion and the emotion of compassion and care are the shimmering silver or glittering gold dust. And compassion is the glue that rejoins the sense of ourselves or, or caring or caring, compassionate body mind response. It's a lovely metaphor to remind ourselves, that regardless of what the conditions are, you know, and compassion by, by definition is compassionate towards something in distress or disconnection or caring that, that our being or another's being or community's being remain strong, connected, like that whispering of the stars, that silent bond, like the cohesion of the water element. This poem is called The White Horse. The youth walks up to the white horse to put its halter on. And the horse looks at him in silence. They are so silent, they are in another world. That's by D.H. Lawrence. They are so silent, they are in another world, the youth and the horse.
This is Kobayashi Isa, who lived in from 19, uh, 1763 to 1828. I'm going to roll over, so please move, Cricket. I, I think of that when I'm laying here listening to the evening or morning cicadas. They're so, the symphony of their sound is so intense. Feels like they're inside my hut, <laughs> but they're just right out the window. And I think of that when I, when I turn my body to one side. I want to repeat that. This is Yosa Buson, Japanese, seventeen sixteen to seventeen eighty four. Coolness. The sound of the bell as it leaves the bell. There's such a profound caring in that. And Isa again, the distant mountains are reflected in the eye of the dragonfly. So much care and compassion in those voices. So we hope you've found a rhythm to your practice and you know pause once again to to feel the sense of your own okayness that it's okay it's good it's good enough and recognize the fear of losing that okayness when we're aware of feeling it that this is okay, this is good enough. You know, I feel enough care, compassion for myself or other beings around, close or in the distance. As well, recognize moments where we fear losing that energy, that cohesion and flow of compassion. Because when we're mindful of that fear, the fear slips away, slides away in that moment and following moments of mindfulness. And so, so strong and pure is a moment of pre-verbal awareness. It doesn't coexist with fear. It notices fear, but it notices the disappearance of fear that notices it as it's falling away. It may arise again, of course, and we may notice several moments, you know, a fear or fear of loss until there's a, a space and the rhythm that returns and reconnects us and we pick up again the element of karuna, of compassion, and continue, continue with our practice. Remember too, to do the to the degree that it feels that it works for you, the six sense door practice. So, what is seen, we feel care for. The visual experience is light and light particles, light waves pouring into the body through eye sensitivity. What is heard, we feel care for as the sound vibrations enter our body through the ear, 
sensitivity, what we feel in the body, textures of earth element, cohesion and fluidity of water element, the heat, the fire element, and the support and vibration of air element those felt senses in the moment of feeling that, we care for that. We care for the body on that level of minutia. Just a point of sensation or the field of sensations of the whole mind-body energy field. And let me just try to bring it along with us as we walk or move or dance through the day. Sit down or lay down all those things. And when grief or sorrow arise, not to dismiss it, you make a shelter for the grief. And then whatever combination of mindful awareness that recognizes the grief and accompanying sensations in the body or direct directing our compassion, caring for the grief, feeling the sensations in the body of caring and the sensations in the body of the grief. And just transferring some of the sensations of care and compassion in a circle of compassion around the grief or sorrow or loss. That's our work. That's why we do this practice. This is my last poem and the end of the talk by Matsuo Basho a field of cotton as if the moon had flowered. Thank you. Those of you who came for the Sunday sitting, it's nice to see you. And uh, for those of you who are on retreat with us right now, we'll gather again in just a, over an hour for the metta chant sit and closing of the weekend. <laughs>